stand all over the house this evening. Let's join together in worship, singing an old hymn of the church. I'll fly away. Let's worship. Let's remain standing for prayer. Lord, we just love you and we worship you tonight. Lord, we glorify the name that is above every name. Lord, we pray you would be with us in the service this evening. And God, you would bless the remaining portion of this service. And we give you all praise and glory and honor that's due your name. In Christ Jesus, we pray. And all God's people together said amen. amen. And let's take the next few moments and greet those around you in the name of the Lord this evening. God bless you.
Sunday. Let's stand all over the house this evening and go back into a few songs of worship before Bible study this evening. Let's worship the Lord. Well, there's a feeling in the air that God is everywhere and His resurrection power is moving in this hour that Jesus might be born. There's a feeling, there's a feeling in the air that God is everywhere and His resurrection power is moving in this hour. Oh, I'll glorify Oh, there's a feeling, there's a feeling in the air that God is everywhere and His resurrection power is moving in this hour that Jesus might be Oh, there's a feeling, there's a feeling in the air that God is everywhere and His resurrection power is moving in this hour that Jesus might be Oh, I will glorify. I pray that you would bless the remaining portion of the service tonight. Lord, I pray that you would bless the message that is to be spoken tonight and continue to speak to our hearts. Thank you for the presence of God we felt in this house this morning. We pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people together said amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord at this time.
see what we can get going here this evening. And uh, find my scriptures here. Let's take about two seconds and um, ask the Lord to help us glean from the table. How many of you ever know what I'm talking about when I say go to Mama's house and eat? Anybody ever go to Mama's house? I mean, maybe, I mean, I don't know all your history, but for some of you, I know going to Mama's house to eat was a good thing. I mean, she had everything in the kitchen sink on the table. Mine did. My daddy did. My mom was already gone, but my daddy did. You go to my daddy's house. Time as you walked in the door. You hungry? Especially if you knew you were coming. You hungry? See? That's what I'm saying. And, the, and the, so, you know, every, all the pots on the stove. I cook so-and-so because that's Keith's favorite. I cook yours because that's, you know, I cook Jonathan blah, blah, because that's his favorite. Right? He spent all day cooking. Yes, he did. And he loved it. And so did we. And then he said, now, when you go home, take it with you. But you know what one of my favorite was? My grandmama's house. Because if she had biscuits left over from, you know, what if she had roll biscuits, they, they, they might be on the stove or on a plate or whatever, and they probably had a napkin or something thrown over the top. You didn't even need a microwave. Throw some gel, Bama jelly in there, and you thought you were living. I don't know, that's what they did in Lake City. I don't know what they do everywhere else. That's what they did in her house. And cane syrup, yep, you had that too. Had that too. It's a good thing to be at the Lord's house and to sit at his table. He's always got something prepared. Brother Mary, it always tastes good. Sometimes it's a little bitter depending on my attitude if I need a little, you know, adjustment. <laughs> but it was always a good thing to go to his house, and it still is. Father, thank you for the privilege we have to be in your house. Lord, thank you for spreading a table for us again, just like we were talking about when you just go home. Lord, spread the table for us today in a way that we glean from your word. Lord, that when we leave your house, it will have been food to our soul. and Lord, it will be strength and nourishment to us, encouragement to us. God, that when the end of this day has come and our eyes are closed, we can... Again, say, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. For it's in the name of Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen. There should be a picture somewhere of a table. No? Yeah, there you go. So we're going to be talking a little bit about this tonight, um, this table of showbread. And uh, hopefully we'll... We'll glean something together, okay? In the book of Exodus, in chapter 25, um, verses 23 through 30, it talks about this second article of furniture that's in the holy place, and it sits across the, uh, across from the candlestick. In just a few minutes, we'll talk about why that's important. But the Bible says that in Exodus 25 and 23, it describe, begins the description of, of this table. And the Bible says, when God's speaking to, to Moses, he said, Thou shalt make a table of shittim wood, and some translations say acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. Now, Let's lay the cubit down a minute. Let's just talk about in, you know, Berkeley County terms. What does that look like? So it was about 18 inches wide. It's about 27 or so inches high. And uh, it's about three feet long. So it actually is a... I almost drew a bad joke there. I'll just stop. But I know I looked at you. I couldn't help it. It came to me, Miss Tina. But it, it was a little bit lower to the ground. Okay, it was, it was a, the table sat sort of low, okay? As a matter of fact, it's considered the lowest piece 
in, in height. It's the lowest piece of furniture in the house. But when we start talking about what is behind this and what does it mean, I, I think it's important to note that it's in the position that it is because if it, you say, well, if it was high, maybe that means it's lofty. But if it's low, who can get to it? Right? So it could be construed, maybe, that this piece of furniture is lower, lower to the ground, if you will, or would portray, if you will, that it's not hard to get to. It's not above you. It's readily accessible to you. It is not out of reach for me. It's not out of reach for you. The truth is, it's not going to be out of reach for anybody with a check. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay. It was made of acacia wood, the Bible says, or like I said, shittim wood. But why that wood? Why did it have to be that particular? Why was God so particular? I mean, he's kind of picky now about all these things. Why would he be so particular about what it's made out of? If you, if you do any homework on the acacia wood, for the time of uh, the tabernacle and where, where they were located, this particular wood was known for its durability and for its resistance to decay. Now, I must confess, when I saw that resistance to decay, it, it kind of struck my attention just a little bit, and my mind went to um, tooth decay. In this, ca- in this case, it's not this, this table is about preventing tooth decay, okay? And we'll talk about that in just a minute. What does that, what does that even mean? But this type of wood is not readily, um, is not readily uh, worn out. And that's important because remember they, when they, every time they moved, they had to, had to pick it up and carry it and whatever. And so... It was known to be durable. It was known to resist decay. In chapter 25 and verse 24 and 25, the Bible then speaks that it shall be overlaid with pure gold and thereto make a crown of gold round about it. Thou shalt make into it a border around it of a handbreadth, and thou shalt make a golden crown um, on the border thereabout. This, this description of this table and the fact that it was overlaid in gold. Why is that a big deal? Well, we know that gold speaks to, you know, royalty or, you know, it's, it's, it was very expensive and kings would be known to have that. And so when the Bible talks about it is it is overlaid with pure gold, notice pure gold, pure gold. In a minute, we're going to talk about that, why that could be significant, pure gold. But the crown would emphasize the royal quality of this table and would speak to the fact that at this table, this is not an ordinary table. Anybody know um, the story of King Arthur and his court? Anybody ever remember that literature or whatever? Let me steal something from that. Kings in that day had long tables, and that's where their generals and the people that were important, you know, their family, et cetera, and, and they would, uh, the Bible even talked about it for King David, how many, you know, how many oxen and whatever they had to slay in order to feed everybody. It wasn't just, you know, a, a four-seater card table. It was, this table, it was no common table. It spoke of royalty. Why would that be important? We come in. Because here, in this place, the people that will gather at this table are not ordinary people. Now, you say, well, in that day it was the priest. You are correct. But Miss Tina's going to read something out of Galatians 4 and 7 that speaks to who we are when it comes to this kind of stuff. Galatians 4 and 7. What does it mean to be an heir? I'm in the will, right? Okay. I'm an heir of whom? Ooh, talk about royalty. Yeah. 
So we are no, Bible says we are no, we are a kingdom of priests. In other words, we don't depend on the collar anymore, right? We, we can get to God. So when we talk about the fact that we are at a table of royalty, if you will, that, and it's, access, it's accessible to us, keep in mind, is it accessible to everybody? Trick question. Tell me again. Notice it said we are we have access according to Galatians 4 if we are an What does it mean to be an heir? Got to be part of the family. You see where I'm going? You can't just be any Remember if the priest didn't have his ducks in a row, what happened brother man when he went in? He had a grease spot, right? So it's not that it's not accessible, but there's a condition to it. We have to be an heir. Notice in Exodus 25, 26 through 29. Let me read something else to you here. Talking about the same table now. Thou shalt make for it four rings of gold and put the rings in the four corners that on the four feet thereof. Over against the border shall the rings be places of the staves to bear the table. Thou shalt make the staves of shittim or acacia wood and overlay them with gold that the table might be borne with them. And thou shalt make the dishes thereof, the spoons thereof, the covers thereof, the bowls thereof, to cover with all of pure gold thou shalt make them. Now this is important. The Bible was very clear that they had rings that they would basically put a stave through to be carried on the shoulders of, 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 of the, the priest. Okay? In other words, they didn't just pick it up and move it. It could not be handled with the hands of men. This is going to be very important in a minute as we talk about what's on this table because remember, when we talk about the things of God, they cannot be handled loosely. What do I mean by that? Don't handle the things of God loosely. Casually. Um, flippantly. We as a church have lost our reverence to the things of God. I mean, we really have. And if we took thought of how we handle the things of God, the word of God, the praise to God, if we thought seriously about how we handle the, the purity of the things of God and our lack of reverence, we would be afraid. We would be reverentially fearful, but people aren't. Because, in, and we won't go there, but it goes back to that illusion. Remember we talked about um, Adam and Eve, whenever Eve ate of the fruit, and it's like, yeah, God said they would die. And they said, no, he didn't. Look at that, you didn't die. What are you talking about? You didn't die? That was a, that's not true. The illusion is, is that they didn't die. That is not true. Prior to that, they would not have physically died. So death comes. We talked about death in relationships, death of, of physical bodies, etc. All that came about because of disobedience. It's not handling the things of God the way he said. Now, in Exodus 25 and 30, it says, And thou shalt set the showbread on the table before me at least once a month. Every quarter. Always? Now, I'm not going to tell you to turn there, but I want to remind you of something we just studied uh, quickly, and that was a particular, um, a particular offering. It was the meat or meal offering. It was made with grain, um, and the Bible talks about that it was made of fine flour, and they would pour oil and frankincense on it, and this this particular offering was a response, my response to the blessings of God, his everyday provision to me. It was my thanksgiving back to God for, for his goodness to me. That is, that is correlating to what we're getting ready to talk about here. He says, and upon the table, sh put the, set the showbread before me always. The word showbread there, and in, in, um, in one 
uh, in King James, it'll say shoe bread, S-H-E-W bread. But when you look it up in the original language, it means the bread of presence or faith. What it's talking about here is this is where God and man will commune how? Face to face. You said, and we can't look on the face, we can't look on the holiness of God. We would die. But this will be the place where God sets up for this time for this priest and for future us as priests a place of where there will be communion or communication or etc. but not through somebody else. Me and you mean not the whole church? Not the whole nation? Not the, that's a big deal. This is, this is directly point. This is me and God and me, right? Face to face. And the Bible said it was supposed to be there all the time. It is, it is constantly to be exhibited before the face of God. God was supposed to be able to look at that, in that in, on that table all the time. If you will notice, there are two stacks and there's six cakes, if you will. Now, there's a bunch of hoo-ha about whether they stack them or put them in rows, whatever. There's 12 of them, okay, made of fine flour. Anybody know what the purpose of that was? One for, okay, one for each tribe. In other words, if you go about it thinking that way, there was one for each, each tribe or everybody represented here. Okay, everybody had representation on the table. And this table is available, we said, for everyone who qualifies. Everybody who wants it. Okay? Matthew 5 and 6. Somebody's Matthew. Did I get Matthew? Okay. Ms. Bueller, can you give me Matthew 5 and 6? Has anybody ever tried to feed a baby that didn't want to eat? <laughs> Your pastor was famous for not liking green peas. Yeah. And the doctor told me, you can't give him applesauce all the time, right? You got to give him you know, blah, blah, blah. I, Primo, it wasn't red rice, man. I mean, he hadn't got to that point yet. I'm telling you, it was green peas. And he, would, he was so slick. Because you could sit him in the high chair and you'd go to feed him and he blew it back at you. Not hard, he just said. So you kind of clean it up, reroute. Sister Mary, he'd, he'd wear you down over those green peas. You can't feed people who don't want to be fed. Anybody know a spiritual application to that? but we want them to get it. But, I mean, we preach it hard. We teach it hard. We try to love it in. We try to, you know, talk about it at work. We try to, I mean, we're doing everything we can. We invite them to all our stuff. and you know, But what? Those that hunger, heard, we, we've all heard this. You can't, you can't, force people to you can't take a, a horse to water and make him drink but you can put salt in his oats right you know what salt in the oats are it makes him thirsty in my books when it comes to the spirit when I when I've talked until I'm blue in the face I quit talking this way I start talking because the spirit can put in a put salt brother Mary and it worked where I can't you with me? That's it. That's the way it works. And so the food is always there. The bread is always there. But somebody's got to be an heir. They've got to want to eat, right? And it says that the, uh, the, the Bible says in Leviticus 24, and I'll just tell you the reference there, but it says at the beginning of the Sabbath every week, fresh bread had to be put on the table. They actually had a little ceremony. Kind of like change it under guard kind of thing. 
thing, you know, when the fresh bread came out. I mean, the, in other words, it wasn't, they, they couldn't leave the table blank. In other words, when, when this one came off, the hot bread came on, right? The bread was not allowed to become stale. This was a place of covenant. God said it needed to be there always. And my good media man's going to help me find Amos 8 and 11, because I don't think, I didn't give anybody Amos 8, did I? No, but the media man will help me get there. Thank you, sir. Now, the, the Bible points out that there is continuous provision at the table, but when I read that, I thought of this, and I'll um, give you a quote from Matthew Henry, who's known for um, his commentary on the Bible. But of this scripture, Behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land. What kind of famine? Not a bread. Not even water. But what's the famine? Hearing of the word of the Lord. Now listen, this is what, this is what uh, Matthew Henry says about that particular scripture. He says, this is a sign of God's greatest displeasure. For people to have to travel far to hear a good sermon. Let, according, this is Matthew Henry now. Let us value our advantages seeking to profit by them for fear of sending them away. Not sending, sin, S-I-N. Sending them away. God said there's a day coming. There won't be fresh bread on the table. We're here. I mean, we're here. You know how you used to turn on anything? I mean, you know, radio, the TV, the, you know, YouTube, whatever. You could find stuff. No, it was like that jump off the, off the airwaves. Now you listen to it and it's like, harder to find. I'm not saying it's not out there. I'm just making a point. You see how it's getting harder and harder? And it's going to get worse than that. But yet he said there always had to be bread on the table. Keep going. The table was never to lack bread. Now I gave somebody Ruth the first chapter and everybody knows this already but anybody got it? Okay. Ruth 1 and 1 and then jump down to verse 6. Now, I'm, you know, you've all heard this. You guys have been in church a long time. You know all about this. The word Bethlehem means house of bread. And yet, they had to leave because there was no bread in the house of bread. God help us. Not just this house. What about my house that, where I live? I mean, I could not have bread at my house. And I'm not talking about physical bread. The Bible said they had to go to Moab is considered the world when you look at that in, in Bible passages, if you will. They, were, they, they left the house of bread looking for bread. You know how many people leave church still looking? But God didn't leave it that way. Verse 6 said, but she heard there was, house, there was bread back in the house. You know what the greatest church growth strategy is? I mean, literally. It's been proven for centuries. You know what the best, I mean, all the, all the seminars and, you know, all the stuff. You, you know what the best church growth strategy is? Feed the people fresh bread. But is there a difference? 
between fresh bread and any bread? If there be fresh bread in the house. It's a picture, if you will, where, where the family could gather at the table. I didn't come from a large family. It was just my brother and myself. But some of you had, had no children. Um, this is Sister Brenda Fryer's coming to visit you. Somebody's got a, I mean, a pile of them. How many, how many siblings? Five siblings. How many, how many were at your house? They, what? Have mercy. Huh? Have mercy. I tell you what, let's all go over to, let's all go home with them one Sunday. Let's see if we can stretch. No, I'm just kidding. But you see what I'm saying? A pile of people at the table. God says, I have fresh bread, and as long as you qualify, as long as you're an heir, I got enough bread for who? How many? Everybody. All right. Matthew 6 and 11. Who is that? Who's talking? Anybody know who's talking here? Jesus teaching them how to pray, right? Lord's Prayer. And the Lord goes through, you know, this is how, this is how you pray, right? And he gives it, he said, give us this day our daily bread. What does that mean? Make sure Balos or Walmart delivers. It, whatever provision I need, remember at the table of showbread, that was a place of covenant. It's a place of provision. It's a place where I get face to face, we meet my sacrifice, if you will, that came out of Leviticus 2 of how to, how to make the grain offering is the same as it is to make the cake. And it speaks to my giving back of thanks for God's provision to me. Give us this day our daily bread. Okay, now some of you ladies, I don't know, maybe some of you guys might do this, I'm not sure. How many of you go in, into the store and squeeze the bread to see if it's fresh? I know, I know Brother Henry does, I've seen him do it. Yeah. How do you do that? Well, just pull a loaf off and take it home for Pete's sake. Huh? Why? Why? Still bread. Really? Tell me. <laughs> yes, sometimes they do that, Sister Brenda. Oh, yeah. I started to do that today, but I have to tell you, about 2 o'clock, I said, nah. But I did that at the first, our first church. I did that at our first church, and the uh, first time I'd ever taught this, and I made cinnamon bread, and I put a bunch of extra cinnamon in it so it would really smell good, and took it time as it was, you know, out so it was hot. Yeah, I said, I thought about it. <laughs> I mean, it went right past me. But... What's imp describe fresh bread? Fragrant, soft. I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, absolutely. What else? Good to the taste. Describe stale bread. Good for the dogs. You feed it to the fish birds. or the birds. Okay. There is a difference. Let me, may I say to you spiritually there's a difference between fresh bread and stale bread. How do, you know, how do you know if you're listening to fresh bread versus stale bread? How do you know? I'm sorry? Okay. Now, Brother Randy says your spirit can, can try the spirit, so to speak, or test it. Okay. So, all right. What else? Sorry? Mm -hmm. 
Tell me what? Okay, well, you, you're the pastor. I wouldn't give you the opportunity to not. That's I'll, as much as I hate to, I'll give you credit. Absolutely a fair statement. Sure enough. Yeah. Yep. You know, and, and, and to your point, Pastor, as well as the rest of you, and I believe that's part of the issue of where the Bible talks about an aimless sale come of famine, of, 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 fresh, of bread. People won't know what real bread is. And I would say to you today, there's a lot of people that don't know. I mean, we got people like associated with us that don't have a clue. I mean, they really don't. I mean, they, they have no idea of what that, what that looks like. Okay, so let's, let's add to that. Sure. Well, it goes back to, you know, like I said, what's, if, if I give you a stale roll, and, but that's all you've ever had. I mean, your mama used those hard as a brick rolls. That's what my husband says, and Martha's starting to react too. He likes the soft stuff. Like, don't, I said, oh, there's some more. And when I used to live with him, I said, oh, there's a few more. He said, no, I'm not eating that. Faith's going to pick up some bread. That's stale. That's old bread. I want fresh bread. Like, he didn't like, he wanted soft bread because that's what he knew worked. Right, but when when you when you've only had what you don't know, but the first time you get one of those hot and soft ones like they used to do at um what's the name of that restaurant? Ryan's had the big you know the big whopping mama ones. <laughs> but when it's hot, yeah, and the and the whole butter thing, I'm saying, then they know. And I would agree. Once they've tasted that, um, yeah. <laughs> right? This bread, however, was made out of crushed grain. We've already mentioned here that this is a representation of Christ. Okay? And the Bible says, John 6 and 48. Somebody's got that one. Thing. Six and thirty-five. I'm sorry. Somebody got John six thirty-five. Okay. If you, I mean, in the in John the sixth chapter, Jesus identifies himself as the bread. Okay. And, um, and I won't quote them all, but even down further in that passage of John 6, he talks about being the bread of life. And he says, listen, your fathers ate manna and, and they died. In other words, they, you know, I provided for them. You know, it was a tenuous provision, but I mean, but they died. He says, but I am a living bread. I am the living bread, which came down from heaven. And if any man eats of this bread, he will live forever. For the bread that I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. He says, I'm it. I am the bread. 
We know that and we celebrate that, if you will, when we do communion. Remember? Okay. Um, uh, I think if I'm not, did I give somebody Luke 22? I can't remember. Uh, okay, well, I'll just throw it off the top of my head. Luke twenty two nineteen. This bread, Jesus said, is my body. Take it and eat it. For when you do this, what? You do it in remembrance of me. He said, it's, it's letting you know I am that bread that you partake of. Now, this broken flour, this crushed flour, we understand that Jesus was crushed for us. But there's something to be said, and we often use the word crush when we're talking about pure olive oil, you know, because they would crush it so all the oil pure would come out of it. It is out of those experiences that most often people can be ministered to. You've heard me, you've, 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 I'm sure you have met people who've had catastrophic things, Christians, godly people who've had catastrophic things in their lives. And you think, what could God get out of that? And yet God allows them by his grace to minister to other people who are in that same scenario, Brother Marion, and maybe not even Christians. But they could speak to that and the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God because in that being crushed, they gave it to God for him to use. Jesus was crushed, if you will, for us. He, he was broken in the sense of not his bones, but his life was broken to be that bread for us, to be that sustenance, that provision for us. But are we willing, us, are we willing to allow a place of crushing our, our um, cross experiences? What do I mean by cross experiences? Jesus said, if I be lifted up, what happens? Okay. If I allow God to have my cross experiences and not lift me up, lift him up, if he be lifted up, then that's what draws people. People don't want to hear about me. They don't want to hear I, I, I. They don't, people turn you off. They don't want to hear about you. I mean, I hate to say that. They don't want to hear about me. People don't care about us. What's going to make the difference? I could tell, we could talk about all day about us. But that's not going to change people. What changes people? Jesus changes people. So if I'm talking about me, I'm taking time away from telling them about him. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all people. I am that bread. In, um, did I give anybody Deuteronomy 8 and 3? Miss Sandy, would you read that one for me, please, ma'am? Again, this is a covenant promise. This purpose of this table is to help us understand that we live by the bread that comes from the mouth of Jesus Christ. Period. Without any other sustenance won't work. It won't, it won't give life. It won't give continual provision. Did you notice that this table, now their staves are there, but it's readily accessible. You can get to it. It's not in a cave, so to speak. So it, that be the case, and it's an open table from the perspective of being able to reach or to get it. There are no barriers, no denominational barriers, no racial barriers, no socioeconomic barriers. There's no barrier that prevents, if I'm an heir to the kingdom, from me going to that table. All around us, there are people who are hungry for answers to things they cannot understand. But too often the word is broken and shared, but people only take nibbles, niblets of it. They don't 
eat it. They don't hunger after it. Like children who have spoiled their appetites with junk food, the church is sick with an absence of hunger for bread that really nourishes. Let me read that again and you tell me what it means. Like children who have spoiled their appetites with junk food, the church is sick with an absence of hunger for bread that really nourishes. What does that mean? I'm sorry? They don't want, what do they want? Ms. Gill says they don't want the word. They, what do they want? They want what? They want somebody to make them feel good. Well, I mean, I like people to make me feel good. Junk food generally tastes good. Agreed? I mean, generally. I mean, you know, if you open a bag of Doritos, I mean, it, it tastes like Doritos, right? Unless you eat the whole bag. I'm not talking about the one ounce now. You know what I'm talking about? Well, you can, but it'd be a pretty bad diabetic pretty quick, right? Heart disease, yeah. Everything got to be within balance. People don't, people want what people, they want what tastes good, what sounds good. They want you to tickle their ears. The Bible talks about that. They, they'll look for those kind of people. That's who they'll, that's who they'll gravitate to. Oh, absolutely. Sure. Matter of fact, that's a... Valid point. In this case, I am to feed myself at the table... The Bible said, to my full, feed myself full of his bread so that I, in turn, can give it to someone else. Now, let me give you an example. Somebody's got Mark 7. Can I got Mark 7 or I give it to everybody? I might not have. My good pastor, could you go to Mark 7 for me? 24, start in verse 24 for me, please. So there he rose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. He entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard from him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek or a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Jesus said to her, now this is kind of cold here, by the way. Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first. Excuse me? Really? Ooh, that's kind of rough. Let the children be filled first, for it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the, what? Throw it to the dogs? Have mercy. Keep going, Pastor. And she answered and said to him, Yea, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. One more, I think. Then he said to her, For this saying, Go your way, the demon has gone out of your daughter. Listen, there will be people, according to our recent conversation here, who, when their world falls apart, when, everything, when they're in real need, they need the real deal bread, right? But if we're not full of the real deal bread, there's no crumbs for them to grab a hold to. Let me say it this way. This is a, Mel this is a Melody Vaughn analogy. I use it all the time when I pray, every day, did today. God... Help me to fill my cup and overflow. Because if I stand up in this church and try to minister without my cup being full and overflowed, in other words, I minister. This is a great sermon, Pastor, if you ever need one. This is, I'm just saying. I minister out of the overflow. What does that mean? Minister out of the overflow. That means when I have filled myself. 
I mean, it could be in song, in all fairness, Miss Sherry, right? Leading worship. Brother Man, it could be Sunday morning, Sunday school. But I, I don't want to say cram, that's not the right way to say it, but I fill myself up full. It's so full, it's, it's, Brother Henry, it's tipping over the top of the cup. My cup runneth, and then I can minister out of the overflow. Because what happens there is I'm not ministering out of me now, right? I'm ministering out of the God in me. Because what happens is when we try to minister out of us, what happens? I'm sorry? We fall short. Not only do we fall short, we will wear out in our attempt. You know, really, and people get real mad about this, but really, from, if you went by true biblical standard here, a pastor should spend his time not out there. Technically, right? Where should he be? In the holy place. In the holy place. In speak. Now, you say, well, that's an excuse for a lazy preacher. I promise you, if, if a man or a woman spends time that they should doing what they should do in the holy place, it is not a golf day. That is hard work because you are battling with the devil toe to toe. I'm just making a point that when that man or woman stands back up in a pulpit on a Sunday morning, they're not speaking oracles of man. They are speaking oracles of because bread that feeds has to be hot, fresh bread. And the Bible says in, um, we won't, I'll tell you where it's at. We won't spend a lot of time because I think it's getting tight here. The table place represents a place of revelation as well. This is found in Luke, the 24th chapter, verses 15. Did I, I gave that to somebody. Yes, by all means, Miss Mary. Jump down to verse 30 for me and read 30 to 32, Miss Mary. some spiritual heartburn. We need some spiritual heartburn. Not the kind that tongues takes away. I'm talking about the kind that when when we break bread with the with with Jesus, we walk away and the as those men did and said, "Did our heart not burn?" And you know the whole deal about burning hearts Burning hearts will burn out the trash in my life. The Bible uses the word shaft in some places, right? But it, it burns out the impurities of my life. Holy heartburn. When we spend daily, always bread, daily provision, hot bread at the table, face to face with God. And notice... In one of the previous scriptures, it talks about the bread would be sprinkled with incense. Incense in the Bible, in this reference, would have to do with prayer. So when I spend my time on my face in this book covered by prayer and the oil of God's Spirit creating revelation to that, you got to remember, what's the only light in, in the holy place? Anybody know? Anybody remember? When you go in the holy place, what's there? Lampstand, right? Or the candlestick. We said that oil was a representation of what? Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So the whole point is this. When we go into the holy place and the, and the bread, the word is over here, and the spirit, the light is over here, they have to work together. The 
the light of the, the Spirit of God will illuminate the Word so that it makes sense, so that it burns within us. Many people try to partake of the bread of God in darkness because they don't allow the Spirit of God to illuminate the light for them to understand what that looks like. We are to come to the table hungry, take it out to others, and give it to them. And when we do so, we will never go out hungry. Somebody got Ecclesiastes 11 and 1. Can I get it? Come on. And that's not just like, you know, the, the sowing and reaping, you know, like giving money or whatever. But it also, it's about a lot of things. It's just a principle. When I sow at the table, I can give it away. I can fill up, give it away. Fill up, give it away. Fill up, give it away. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what God asked us to do. I'm going to read this because I thought it was good. I didn't come up with it. It's out of this gentleman I'm following. It says, a new model of worship must emerge at the table. In the old model, preachers preach. In the new model, people feed and learn. In the old model, there's passive listeners. But in the new model, people must be active learners and bread breakers. In the old model, people eat the bread they want, what they choose, and leave the rest. But in the new model, people eat the bread they need, feeding themselves, and then they distribute it to the street. And I would venture to say... The closer we are to the Lord's coming, all the more reason we need to be at, at the table every day, personally. We can't depend on somebody else. I'm not saying it's not good. To li- I mean, we listen to, you know, YouTubes and, you know, radios and, all, you know, we come to church just like you do. But, but that, that, what happens if all that gets cut off tomorrow? Where am I now? Because if I've depended on everybody, if I never... What's the old adage about um, when you teach a man to fish? Or you're going to have to keep feeding him when? If, if I don't teach him to fish, I'm still given, right? If I teach him to fish, he can learn to feed himself. Same thing spiritually. And, and this is a place of fellowship. Um, Exodus 33 and 11, I didn't give it to anybody, but I'll just kind of quote what's going on there. Did I? Oh, I'm sorry. Give it to me, Sister Sherry. Moses is talking to God how? And, and, and you know, if you know the story, you know when he went out, he had to cover his face because they couldn't stand it. But he had something to give. They'll notice when I've been with the Lord. Somebody will notice if I've been. I don't have to tell them I've been fasting and praying and doing this and doing that and doing that. They'll know. The Bible very clearly says that we have, by definition, in this Laodicean age, we have a generation of fast food Christians. What do I mean by that? What is a fast food Christian? Because we're getting ready to land. What's a fast food Christian? Yeah, hurry up. I got to go. I tell you what now. I, I'm on this thing about table manners. I feel the spirit of my mama half the time when we go out to eat somewhere. So I just want to walk over to the next table and go, did your mama not teach you how to eat? Did your mama not teach you some table manners? Well, I did write that down, but I let you preach that one, right? But Okay, okay, so... So since I didn't bring it up, this is fair game. Tell me about table, about what does that say? What does it, what do bad table manners say? And when I say bad table manners, maybe I can use the phone. I can use the elbows on the table. I can use the, you know, I don't use my, 
whatever, whatever, and I got stuff everywhere, and I'm dropping it everywhere. Okay, but what does that say? No structure, undisciplined. Not what? Not taught. What's the phone do? Turn back to phone. I'm talking about adults now, not Karen. All right, so you guys are telling me that if parents do it, kids do it. You're you're telling me they don't talk to each other. You want some silent conversation? Cut the phone off and, and just watch the table beside you. Watch it. You want to, sometimes you just want to go and say, I'll give you $50. I'll lay a $50 bill right there if y'all go through this whole meal and not use your phone. They'd be like, yeah, that'd be great. But you don't hear a thing. They what? They don't know how to talk. Okay, so now we beat on people long enough. How about spiritually? What about spiritual table manners? What is that? Okay, but it's the same principle. If we come to the Lord's table and we're disinterested, we're not interested in talking to him. We're too busy. Doing what? Huh? Okay, everything else. If my mind is in 5,000 places and I'm supposed to be eating at the Lord's table, You know, if the Lord treated me like my mama did at the table, I guarantee you I'd straighten up. Y'all must not have had a mama like mine. My mama didn't even have to raise her hand. My mama had the famous glasses. Y'all, y'all never heard, some of you heard the story, some of you not. My mama, I don't know why, I think she played basketball or something in high school, broke her nose or something, I don't know the whole story. But my mama wore glasses, but they stayed right here more than they stayed anywhere else. And if my mother ever did this, my mama could wipe out a whole row of teenagers in church and, and only one of them belonged to her. I mean, the whole row. They're like, you could see them. And she'd be in the choir loft. She didn't call them down. She was up there. I wish I had a quarter for every time I saw her do that. I just thought that was the coolest thing. The reason I could laugh is because she didn't let me sit on the back row. My brother sat on the back row with all the teenagers. I had to sit on the first row right there where Sister Carol, Carol was. So I didn't get in trouble. But my mother, buddy, when she did this, she'd be singing. I mean, they'd be, I don't know, some glad morning we shall see. And she's looking over the top. Everybody's feeling God except that row. They're not feeling God. Because my mother taught my brother and me. Not only respect at her table. Oh, my mama was a hot hand when it came to God's table. I had, if I had a quarter for every time I got snatched up for my behavior in church. My mama saw me running in church. I felt like my leg was broken for a week. And she finished. That was before you could abuse children. That, that was back when it didn't matter. But some of y'all had a parent like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, and again, I, I don't want to. I don't want to get into all the dirt here, but you get the point. What I'm trying to say is, at the table, at the table, we can laugh and kind of joke a little bit. But, and I don't want to. I don't want to leave this on a, on a bad note. I just want to be careful to say this. We're to come to that table. That those flasks. One of them. The, the oil of God, the oil to replenish the um, candlesticks was located on that table. The wine, which represented my life's blood, what I gave back to God, you know, my efforts were on that table. But the point to be made to that, and, and I'll close. We are, we do a disservice, and I, I don't want God to hold me accountable for this. I really don't. I want to always speak in love. Always. But I don't want God to hold me accountable and say, you did not tell people the truth. 
I told you to teach them in love how to reverence me, how to fear me. Now, not fear scared, fear reverence, fear reverence. How to fear me because in our attempt to not teach the Word of God in that principle, we have allowed people the opportunity to become casually toward the presence of God, and that is not appropriate. And there will be death. You say, well, God didn't strike you. I haven't seen God strike anybody down. I'm telling you, when we create that atmosphere, we're teaching people to live a life that will lead to death, spiritual death. So I would encourage us, and again, I don't mean in a hard way or a harsh way or slapping up on children and all that. I don't want nothing about that. Or spiritually do that to adults. I'm just making the point that we have an obligation to somebody in this corner. It might have been Miss Sherry. But Sister Sherry, if they don't see it out of me, I, I can ride that all day long. But they're watching my life. I've been doing this for about 20, so almost 40 years. Brother Marion, they've been looking at me. Some of y'all were looking at me. Watch my life. See if I was consistent. And see if I really did what I said I was going to do. See if it would last. To see if I really believe God's word the, set, the way I portrayed it when I said it. And if I live holy, not, not my holiness, but if I tried to live in a way that when I came to the Lord's table, I came to the Lord's house, I came out of reverence. And I didn't come casually. And I did my best. God is my witness. I've done my best. If not only my, the next generation in my family and the next generation to follow, but for some of you, I've done that with your children. Not in a heart. I've done my best to love them. But to show them that it's nothing to be played with. God is holy. And he's a holy God that wants you to come to a table of provision and feed at his table. Not out of fear. My mama loved it when we came to her table and cleaned it out. She loved it. Still had to come. She had to wear your shirt. Couldn't come with no shirt on. Matched my brother up on that one. Couldn't. You, you, you understand what I'm saying, though? You, you had to come the right way to the table. Oh, man, she dole it out. All the good stuff. She loved it. Wash your hands. Use good table manners. And she set us well. He feeds us 